let me say, a word in defense of reason in dialogue with faith. Because faith is that proof. Faith unites us to that substance. But reason, in order to realize its full potential, needs the horizons revealed by and truths contained in the faith. And not just any faith, but the Catholic faith. Well, it is a joy to speak on the subject of the new evangelization and Franciscan University, especially in the aftermath of our celebration of the inauguration of Father Sean. What a gift God has entrusted to us. And let's entrust our prayers to the Lord on his behalf. But something else about this particular day, this date, should stand out because today is October 11th. Does anybody know what that marks? Exactly one year ago today, the year of faith began. Because exactly 50 years before that, Vatican II began. And 20 years before that date, October 11th, 2012, the promulgation of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And so it's a very great and auspicious day for us to be celebrating the new evangelization, especially in the aftermath of this installation and inauguration. This year also marks the promulgation of the first encyclical of Pope Francis. You'll recall the issue date of Lumen Fidei was June 29th, the feast of Saints Peter and Paul, the two principal evangelizers of the first century. I'm convinced that this is a fitting date for the church to receive an encyclical from the hands of the two principal evangelizers of the 21st century, Francis and Benedict. For Francis has spoken of the letter, Lumen Fidei, as being the work of, quote, four hands, his own and those of Pope Benedict. Well, as you know, Peter and Paul were remarkable men, model Christians and model evangelizers. They were, however, very different from one another. They differed in personal style, temperament, pastoral methods, and theological approaches. And yet, their differences back in the first century were as complementary as the differences between Benedict and Francis. Their collaboration with one another, as well as their cooperation with God's grace, launched one of the most remarkable transformations in human history, the conversion of a pre-Christian culture of death to Christ, to Christendom. Likewise, the men who produced Lumen Fidei bid us to have no doubt that the conversion that happened before can happen again, and that God wants to do it even more than we want him to. So we find ourselves here in a year of succession, from Benedict XVI, now Pope Emeritus, to Pope Francis, from Father Terry to Father Sean, with two giants looming behind the scenes for both pairs. John Paul II, blessed John Paul, as well as Father Michael Scanlon, both of whom reigned in their respective roles for well over a quarter of a century. So we need to understand where we are in history to understand why we have been tasked with the new evangelization and why this is no short-term policy but a long-term mission. And I am convinced that Lumen Fidei is a fitting way to begin. Well, because for one thing, Bishop Monfortin cited this, and so did Father Sean. Both of them, in fact, cited Article 25 of this encyclical. Because in Article 25, we have the emphasis on what is called the bond between faith and truth. Precisely that bond which is being questioned, denied, attacked in contemporary culture. In the end, we read, what we are left with is relativism, a dictatorship of relativism. Why? Because contemporary culture thinks that the only real truth is technology, scientific know-how, comfort and convenience. All of this is spelled out in Article 25 of Lumen Fidei. But there is a remarkable statement that comes at the climax of that particular paragraph that I wish to read. In this regard, we can speak of a massive amnesia in our contemporary world. The question of truth is really a question of memory, deep memory, 
For it deals with something prior to ourselves and can succeed in uniting us in a way that transcends our petty and limited individual consciousness. So, what does Pope Francis say? We can speak of a massive amnesia. Truth is really a question of memory, deep memory. I want to use that as a point of departure because I am convinced that with the help of Pope Benedict, Pope Francis has pinpointed what is arguably the single greatest problem we face today, and that is a forgetfulness of God, a forgetfulness of the covenant, a forgetfulness of the blessings that have not only come to the world but have also come to us in the Catholic Church. As we think back to the origins of the new evangelization, we go back, of course, to what the year of faith is commemorating, and that is Vatican II, that started on October 11, 1962. But I think we need to overcome our massive amnesia, not only by going back to Vatican II, but also considering what came before Vatican II, because the church didn't start with Vatican II, nor did a new church begin. There is a hermeneutic of continuity, which is undergirding authentic reform. I'd like to divide up my remarks this evening into two parts. First of all, I'd like to look at the new evangelization, and then secondly, I'd like to look at Franciscan University's unique role as the flagship university of the new evangelization, quoting Dr. Cirilla earlier this afternoon. When you compare Vatican II to Vatican I, one thing stands out. It is the Catholic faith. Back in 1870, the marriage of faith and reason, that the incarnation of the eternal word made possible, was precisely what the great teaching of that council was focusing on. And as you consider the documents of Vatican II, the good news of the incarnation, of the Paschal mystery, is certainly updated, but not in any way changed in substance. However, there is one notable contrast when you look at the documents of Vatican I and compare them to the documents of Vatican II, and that is the emphasis on evangelization. Vatican II used the term gospel evangelium only once, and then only to refer to the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It never used the term evangelize, evangelizing evangelization. In contrast, Vatican II mentions gospel 157 times, evangelize 18 times, and evangelization 31 times. So cognates of the Latin evangelium occur approximately 206 times in these 16 documents. Now, you'll recall that Vatican I was suspended because of the invasion of Rome and the Vatican. Vatican II, then, was really the continuation and the completion of what had begun. So even still, I want to emphasize the continuity, the consistency of Vatican I and Vatican II. But when we consider what the Holy Spirit led the bishops to emphasize in the evangelization, we can see the great need that emerged in the 50s and the 60s. Becoming Pope in the middle of Vatican II, Pope Paul VI, formerly known as Cardinal Montini, clarified his selection of the name Paul. There had not been a pope named Paul for centuries. He made it clear that it was his desire to pattern his papal ministry after the apostle to the Gentiles, which he proceeded to implement even before Vatican II concluded in 1965 by going to the Holy Land and to India in 1964. He proceeded to make 15 apostolic journeys to various nations over the course of the next six years. Now, of course, all of that is forgotten and overshadowed because of what Blessed John Paul did. But as a matter of historical fact, no pope before Paul VI had ever made any apostolic journeys to other continents. Shortly after Vatican II was over in 1965, He changed the name of the Congregation of the Propaganda Fide, the Propagation of the Faith, to the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples. When he was getting older and running out of steam and unable to make these apostolic journeys to other continents and nations, he proceeded to devote himself 
to the preparation for a synod on evangelization held in 74 in order to promulgate what proved to be the most influential document of his ministry that came out the next year, Evangelii Nunciandi on Evangelization in the Modern World. Just three years before he was called home to heaven, he stated the thesis of this particular document from the outset, and it was the cumulative and climactic statement of years of ministry going back to the middle of Vatican II. He said, and I quote, evangelization is in fact the grace and vocation most proper to the church, her deepest identity. She exists in order to evangelize, to be the channel of the gift of God's grace, to reconcile sinners with God, and to perpetuate Christ's sacrifice in the Mass, which is the memorial of his death and glorious resurrection. Unquote. Note how the Pope identified the church's mission to evangelize with the Eucharistic sacrifice, the Paschal mystery, which for us is at the heart of the Catholic gospel. But as I said, these amazing accomplishments were eclipsed because of what blessed John Paul proceeded to accomplish. From 1978 until 2005, he made well over 100 apostolic journeys, clocking in nearly a million miles but basically picking up the theme that had been left off from Vatican II and Pope Paul VI. The term new evangelization was actually not found anywhere in the documents of Vatican II, nor employed by Pope Paul VI. It was utilized for the very first time when John Paul returned to his own homeland of Poland. In June of 1979, on the 9th, when he had returned to his own diocese of Krakow to speak to the factory families gathered at Nova Huta, where he knew after the boot heels of Nazism and communism, these factory families had been oppressed and brought to the point of spiritual exhaustion. He used this meeting as the occasion to emphasize what he identified, diagnosed as the deepest need for his own countrymen, and that is a new evangelization. But he didn't employ that phrase again for another four years. It wasn't until he came back to America, addressing American bishops at Port-au-Prince, Haiti. In 1983, he announced that the new evangelization was not just a diagnostic need that would be addressed by the church, it would be the highest priority and long-term mission that would fulfill the rest of his own ministry. Curiously, he announced in 1983 at Port-au-Prince, Haiti, that he would see the beginning of the new evangelization in a formal sense coincide with the coming of the year 1992. Why, he was asked. Because, he said, that will mark the 500th anniversary of the founding and the first evangelizing of the Americas. And indeed, you go back 500 years, and in 1492, when Columbus was sailing the ocean blue, what were the most populous Catholic countries in the world? They were Italy, Spain, France, and Germany. Five centuries later, what are they today? In first place, Brazil. In second place, Mexico. In the third place, our own United States. Countries that didn't even exist five centuries ago are now the most populous Catholic countries in the world and arguably the most influential for the future of the church. What about those that were the most populous five centuries earlier? They're struggling to rediscover their own spiritual tradition a lost legacy on the, virtual, on, the, on, on, the, on the verge of extinction. So where will we be? That's really the question implied in this mission. Where will the Americas be? Where will the church be in five centuries? Well, I don't know. I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I can tell you this much. That all depends on what we do with our marching orders, with this great commission that has now become our renewed mission. Before 1992 arrived, you might recall that Pope John Paul prepared the church for the official launch of the new evangelization by publishing Redemptoris Missio, the mission of the Redeemer, the thesis of which was the new evangelization and the necessary preparations for it to be properly implemented. Once again, just like Paul VI had done before, John Paul was very clear in stating his thesis, and I quote, I sense that the moment has come to commit all of the church's energies to a new evangelization. 
No believer in Christ, no institution of the church can avoid this supreme duty to proclaim Christ to all peoples. The new evangelization is new not because the church had suddenly stopped evangelizing for centuries. He goes on to make it very clear that the church has always evangelized and will never cease. But what is so new about the new evangelization is not only that it calls forth the efforts of every believer in Christ and every single institution of the church with no exceptions, no exemptions, but that it also is intended to target those who have suffered the loss of faith. This has been a point that has been made for the last two days repeatedly by Father Sean, by Bishop Monforton, as well as uh, by uh, Dr. Don Garvey as well. The new evangelization, we hear a lot about it. I think some people are tempted to regard it as a sort of ecclesiastical jargon. I think already there are signs that a sort of new evangelization fatigue is setting in. Is this just an excuse to create more committees, you know, more dicasteries and this sort of thing? Clearly it's not. But we run that risk unless we really get to the heart of what it means. Now, I've already emphasized the last five decades, as well as the last five centuries, to gain historical perspective. But parenthetically, I'd also like to just mention in passing how important it is for us to also recognize the role of Pope Pius XII, the Pope who had been Pope up until John XXIII, who called the Second Vatican Council. We now refer to him as the venerable Pope Pius XII. Recently, Pope Benedict, now emeritus, said, and I quote, with the exception of sacred scripture, this pope is the authorized source that the Vatican II documents cite most frequently. Thousands of quotations in the preparatory and the final documents of Vatican II. And first place, sacred scripture, second place, Pius XII. In fact, Pope Benedict insisted that the writings, the teachings of Pope Pius XII represent the interpretive key. And when you go back and look at the years that came before Vatican II, you recognize how unnecessary it really is to argue for a hermeneutic of continuity because the continuity is manifest. It is explicit. In less than 20 years, he produced more than 40 encyclicals more than all the other popes of the 20th century put together. But not even half of what Leo XIII did. As President Garvey reminded us this morning, he did 85 in a little more than a quarter of a century. And so when we look to overcome the massive amnesia and recover our own deep memory as Catholic Christians, we lay hold of the legacy of Vatican I and II, of Pius XII, of Paul VI, of Blessed John Paul, as well as Benedict and Francis. Sometimes we're too close to history to recognize the uniqueness and importance of the events that are happening all around us because we had midterms this week. (laughs) And what could be more important? Well, do not give in to the tyranny of the urgent. It is time to step back and to recognize the divinely important events that are going to define who we are and what we do together as Catholic Christians and as members of Christ's body who are called here to Franciscan University of Steubenville. As I mentioned a moment ago, the new evangelization is new, not because the church had ceased and now is resuming, but because the particular form of evangelization has emerged in a distinctive way. John Paul distinguished two forms of evangelization. The first form he identified as primary, and that is precisely what the church has been doing for peoples who have never heard of the gospel or encountered Jesus. It's an unbroken record of 2,000 years of priests, religious, missionary societies, and martyrs. But a second evangelization, or a re-evangelization, is precisely what is required wherever Christians have lost a living sense of the faith and no longer consider themselves as living members of Christ's mystical body. For blessed John Paul, Benedict, and now Francis, 
Both priorities are inseparably linked and equally urgent, but the new evangelization represents a long-term commission, a long-term mission, commitment. Now, a lot of people, again, I just want to make this statement and move on, a lot of people thought that the new evangelization was really a program for the last decade of the 20th century. Preparation for the great jubilee, for the celebration of the new century, the new millennium, and whatever else might be coming that would be new from the magisterium. But back in the 90s, Blessed John Paul referred to the 90s, that decade, not as the period of the new evangelization, but what he called the Advent season of the new evangelization. I didn't notice it at the time. Like most people, I thought that last decade marked the period of the new evangelization. But one man who did notice and then follow through on that was known back then as Cardinal Ratzinger. He recognized that if the last decade of the 20th century marks merely the Advent season of the new evangelization, well, what does the analogy imply? Advent season lasts for four Sundays, leaving 48 more to go before the liturgical year is over. So the last decade of the 90s is sort of like the first four Sundays. This was never a short-term strategy. This was always a long-term commitment. And no wonder, because throughout the world, but especially in the Americas and most particularly in the U.S., we have disturbing statistics that indicate a serious problem. The Pew Research Center recently released some findings. Only 30% of Americans raised Catholic are still practicing, quote-unquote. 30%. And the definition of practicing used in the survey was that they attend Mass at least once a month. So 30% of Americans raised Catholic are practicing by going to Mass once a month at least. Another 38% hang on to the Catholic label as cultural Catholics, but, quote, seldom or never attend Mass. The other 32% no longer even consider themselves Catholic. Of these, 3% follow a non-Christian religion, 14% consider themselves unaffiliated, and 15% have joined a Protestant church community. Now, if the good shepherd leaves the 99 to find the one stray, what do the shepherds do under such circumstances as these? And this is where we have to collaborate with the shepherds because no believer, no institution of the church is exempt. All of us are called, and this is an important part of what is so new about the new evangelization. But it's also new because we come to a deeper and a newer understanding of what conversion means. Conversion is not simply what happened to us as infants when we were baptized or what happened to me on the Easter Vigil of 1986 when I was received into the Catholic Church, conversion is something that is ongoing, ever deepening. And the paradigm of conversion that has been used by the mystics and the masters of the spiritual life in the past has always been St. Peter, who undergoes a series of conversions through the Gospels in the book of Acts all the way to his own glorious martyrdom. So this is something that is ongoing, It is ever deepening. It is lifelong, but it is also daily, and it never ceases to be difficult. Why? Because as Jesus said, if any man would follow me, let him take up his Bible every day and follow me. (laughs) No, that's what I wish he had said. He said he'd take up, we'd have to take up a cross. And a cross never feels good, and it never feels light. It's always going to require supernatural grace to overcome our own natural weaknesses. Now, I could say some more things about the new evangelization, but let's just clarify the points that we've made thus far. First of all, the distinctive meaning of new evangelization is re-evangelizing the de-Christianized, the de-Catholicized. Secondly, the distinctive goal of the new evangelization is ongoing conversion that is ever deepening, lifelong. The distinctive scope of the mission of the new evangelization is universal. All of us are participants, no exemptions, but all of us are also recipients. 
we are to receive the gospel and be evangelized before we go out and evangelize others. We inhale the spirit of God's breath and then exhale and proclaim the word. We are called to follow Jesus as disciples and then we were sent out as apostles. But when they became apostles, they didn't cease to be disciples. So we don't either. Conversion is ongoing and ever deepening and so is the mission of the new evangelization. One other feature of the new evangelization deserves be highlighted, and that is the distinctive goal. We can see that it's not just a conversion that is a -a once-in-a-lifetime event. We can also begin to sense that this conversion is not simply that is a lifelong experience for individuals, because what the new evangelization faces is the dictatorship of relativism, a radical secularism, a post-Christian culture of death, And so the distinctive goal of the new evangelization, as Blessed John Paul made clear on numerous occasions, is not only a culture of life to counteract the culture of death, it is a civilization of love rooted in truth, based upon the life of the family, in the natural order, but also the supernatural family of God. So when we think about what it is we do in the new evangelization as Catholics, we recognize there's a difference between what we do and what non-Catholics do. Now, I I recognize that there are still obstacles and objections that probably should be addressed or at least recognized. Let's face it, there are many cradle Catholics that we encounter who are a little skeptical of all this talk about the new evangelization. And no wonder, because evangelization has been associated so often in the past with non-Catholics, sometimes with anti-Catholics, sometimes with ex-Catholics who are especially anti-Catholic. And also we recognize that the means can be anti-intellectual, emotional, and downright manipulative. Besides, in America, religion is a private matter, and there are many Catholics who prefer to keep it that way. And so the idea of being an evangelical Catholic still strikes many people as a sort of oxymoron, like a married bachelor. I am convinced that once we come to understand what the good news really entails, we'll see that it's not a contradiction or an oxymoron, it's a virtual redundancy. To be truly Catholic is to not only be embraced by the gospel, but it is to long for others to be so embraced. Now, we've already heard references to the other objection. That is, well, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. The words of St. Francis of Assisi, correct? Well, I uh, talked to a number of professional Franciscan historians here and elsewhere, and you can look all you want, but you can't find any proof that he actually said those words. But regardless, if any man ever lived a life that was so holy, words were unnecessary, it was St. Francis. And what did he do? He used words all the time, just like his master and our Savior. There's a man who lived a life so holy that words would, would have been unnecessary, except, of course, they're not. And if ever you're tempted to think that your life is just so upright, so compelling, that all you need to do is live it and let other people watch you And that will evoke the grace of conversion. Look in the mirror, but then before you answer the question yourself, ask your roommate or your spouse. (laughs) There is no reason that we should begrudge the evangelical non-Catholics for evangelizing, but I think it is time for us to take up the task ourselves. There's another aspect of the new evangelization that is worth highlighting, and that is what Blessed John Paul emphasized back in May of 1982. In the year of the launch of the new evangelization, he gave a talk on several occasions, and it was published in L'Observatore Romano, entitled, Base the New Evangelization on the Eucharist. Cardinal George echoed those words by saying that all evangelizers proclaim Christ, Catholic evangelizers proclaim a Eucharistic Christ. More recently, Archbishop Gomez of the Los Angeles Archdiocese said, and I quote, Catholic evangelization must be intensely Eucharistic, unquote. And no wonder, because for us, 
It is more than a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that is established when you discover, one, God loves me, two, I've sinned, three, Christ died for that sin, and four, I must believe in order to lay hold of that gift. These are the four spiritual laws that have been shared tens of millions of times by non-Catholic evangelizers, and there is no reason why Catholic evangelizers can't identify the initial kerygma in the same terms. Because this is where it starts, with the love of God. And yet it also must proceed to recognize the bad news of our sin before the good news of the divine cure is embraced, that is Christ's death and resurrection. And so the necessity of faith, that fourth and final stage, is not the end game, it's the beginning. These are the first four steps of the prodigal son on the long journey back to the father's house. And where it ends is, of course, in the Holy Eucharist. More than a personal relationship, more than a personal commitment, we have an interpersonal covenant. And this is where the new evangelization has so much to learn from the old evangelization, because the old evangelization, as the Catechism describes it, went in three stages. Evangelization entailing initial conversion, when you hear the simple gospel. And then, after being evangelized, you're catechized, where you learn the Apostles' Creed and the Our Father. You learn to pray and fast. But after a prolonged period of being catechized, you are then sacramentalized on the Easter Vigil with baptism, confirmation, and Eucharistic communion. That is the goal, but even that is still but a beginning. So it is in the natural order. When you fall in love, it's a period of courtship. When you make a commitment, like I did with Kimberly back in the 70s, it's engagement. But the goal of that was, of course, the marital covenant that we entered on August 18, 1979. Interpersonal communion, a family bond that reflects the inner life of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is why, for us, it isn't a sprint, but a marathon. It's something that can be started in a day, but it's not over and done in a day. It takes days, weeks, months, years. It takes a lifetime precisely because the need is for ongoing and ever-deepening conversion. Now, just, again, somewhat parenthetically, I want to mention that for us, the Paschal mystery is the gospel. The Paschal mystery of Jesus' death and resurrection. But framed as it is in the Eucharist that Jesus instituted on Holy Thursday and then the Eucharist that the church celebrates on Sunday. I remember a conversation that I had with a dear friend from high school who I ran into. He had been a cradle Catholic. I had shared my faith and tried to get him to leave. Years later, he did. And he shared with me one day in an airport his excitement that now he was an evangelical Bible Christian. He was shocked and chagrined to find out that I called myself an evangelical Bible Catholic Christian. (laughs) When we started talking over the matter... I went straight to the advice of Blessed John Paul. I based this new evangelization on the Eucharist. I wanted to re-evangelize this fallen away Catholic. And so, to make a long story short, he emphasized the fact that the Mass was just a meal, as Jesus celebrated it, but Calvary was the sacrifice. In the course of weeks, I tried to show him that Calvary is indeed the sacrifice, but the Mass is more than a meal. Because, ultimately... If you had been there at Good Friday, I said to Chris, as a devout Jew who knew the Word of God, you would not have gone home and recounted your experience later that Friday evening in terms of a sacrifice. For Jews, a sacrifice had to take place inside the temple on top of an altar with a priest standing by to offer that sacrifice, whereas Jesus was crucified outside the walls, far from the temple, where there were no altars with priests standing by to preside. What, any, what, what, what the devout Jews would have gone home and recounted that evening would not have been a sacrifice, but a Roman execution. So the question for them is the same question for us. How did a Roman execution suddenly get turned into a holy sacrifice, the supreme sacrifice of all times? And I showed Chris the answer that the early church fathers showed me, finding it as they did in 1 Corinthians 5 or 7, Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Only by looking at Good Friday in the light of Holy Thursday, only by seeing what happened to Jesus at Calvary in the light of what Jesus had already done 
in the upper room the night before with the twelve, celebrating the Passover of the Old Covenant, but that's not all. He was fulfilling it as the Lamb of God, but that's not all. He was transforming the Passover of the Old Covenant into the Passover of the New, precisely by instituting the Eucharist. I pointed out to Chris, again, what the fathers had shown me, that if the Mass is just a meal, Calvary is just an execution. But if, and only if, the Eucharist that Jesus institutes as the Passover, the New Covenant, is truly a Passover, then it must be a sacrifice first and foremost. The meal aspect is merely a sacrificial communion upon the sacrificial victim. Holy Thursday is what transforms the sacrifice on Good Friday from being an execution to the supreme sacrifice of all time. But likewise, Easter Sunday, the resurrection, is what makes this sacrifice a sacrament that we can do in memory of him that we can offer because his body is no longer bleeding on the cross or buried in the tomb. It isn't just resuscitated. It is glorified, it is deified, and it is deifying us when we receive it in faith. So it isn't how much Jesus suffered on Friday that saves us. It's how much he loves. And the sacrament of love is the Eucharist, and the love of the Eucharist is what transformed that pain into passion and that passion into the power of the salvation of the human race. And as a result, after months of renewed friendship and conversation, I saw the new evangelization work. Chris and his wife not only came back to confession and then to the Holy Eucharist, but he also flew up to, uh, thank you, even a cup of cold water, Daniel. He flew up to Franciscan University of Steubenville. Having come back into the church, he was attending a parish that was a little lackluster, or what he described as underwhelming. (laughs) He came here and was overwhelmed by what he experienced. And I want to use this to sort of serve as a point of departure for the final segment of my presentation, because this is on the new evangelization and Franciscan University of Steubenville. And I'd like to say a few things about the university, but I'd like to begin by telling you what others have said about the university. Cardinal Stafford, for example, who was the president of the Pontifical Council of the Laity for many years in Rome, as well as the Archbishop of Denver at the time of World Youth Day in 1993. He said, and I quote, I'm absolutely convinced both in my experience as the Archbishop of Denver and as the president of the Pontifical Council of the Laity that this university has been central to the reform and the renewal of the Catholic Church after the Second Vatican Council. The British ambassador to the Holy See, His Excellency Francis Campbell, also said, and I quote, Franciscan University speaks volumes in Rome. It is well known in the Vatican because it is a model of what a Catholic university should be. And I have additional quotes as well. But what I'd like to do is to identify some of the graces that God has conferred and entrusted to us. I've only been here since 1990. And I've been very close over the years to Father Michael, whose presidency began way back in 1974. But I'd like to emphasize the fact that the key that really unlocks the grace is precisely what we watched and what we heard yesterday. And that is the sacramental bond that we have with our bishop. And not only because he came here and spoke so eloquently, not only because he is a successor to the apostle, not only because he grants the mandatum to the members of the theology department, but because he is a living link that we share to the apostles and to Jesus himself. Along with the bishop of the diocese of Steubenville, we also have another very important and unique charism, and that is the Franciscan TORs. For now, nearly a quarter of a century have come to see that that friary, that monastery, is more than just a building. It's more than just a community. It is the heart and the soul of this university. And what God has done in the lives of those friars, in their community and in their outreach, not only for you students, but also for us faculty and staff, is nothing less than truly divine. Administering the sacraments and helping us to really focus our minds and hearts upon Jesus' real presence in the Holy Eucharist. Not just daily Mass, which, you know, what is it now? Uh, 70% of our students attend Mass at least twice a week. And I think it's closer to 60% almost daily. 
And where I went to school, there was always compulsory chapel. We had to hand in cards. It's never been compulsory here. And yet precisely because it is so voluntary, the graces of conversion are so deep and so ongoing. But not just for the Mass. The great preaching that we hear from the Franciscans. The brotherhood that we share with them as well. The perpetual adoration that they have established and maintained. The missions that they inspire, not only in spring break and at Christmas time, but also for those who graduate and move on and then go out as Christ commanded his disciples to go and preach the gospel. There are many other aspects to the institutional graces of Franciscan that I have experienced now for nearly a quarter of a century. The summer conferences, especially, here on campus and throughout the country. Earlier this week, I was speaking at Houston Baptist University to 1,200. That was fun. A gal came up to me and she said, you're from Steubenville? And I said, yeah. She, oh, from Louisiana? <laughs> I said, no, it's up in Ohio. Oh, I was planning to go to a Steubenville conference in Louisiana. Well, yes, that's Steubenville of the South, but there's Steubenville of New England, there's Steubenville in Canada, Steubenville out in San Diego. And she's like, that many Steubenvilles? No, no, no. <laughs> These summer conferences that reach out and evangelize high school, between 40 and 50,000 a year are hearing the good news. And she was like, well, it's good to know. And I'm like, yeah, especially when it comes time to choosing your university. <laughs> I mean, that's a staggering statistic. Annually reaching out to over 40,000 high school kids at a time where the culture is not really collaborating with us and sharing the good news of Christ. But some other statistics that I think are remarkable, testimonies not to us and how seriously we take our own public relations, but to the grace of God that works in spite of us, where God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. 11% of all priests ordained in the U.S. in 2013 said they'd participated in a Franciscan youth conference before entering seminary or religious life. 11% of women in the U.S. who professed perpetual vows in 2012 said that they had also participated in Franciscan youth conferences prior to entering religious life. I could go on and on. <laughs> oh, and on. Yeah, they supplied me with a lot of stuff. What I'd like to do instead, though, I could talk about what it's like to have the fraternal bond with my colleagues in the theology department and catechetics, what it's been like to see two, three, four, close to 500 majors in theology and catechetics, most all of whom are double majors, as we always encourage our advisees to do theology and something else, economics, business, or in the case of one of my sons, it's theology, philosophy, psychology, and economics. <laughs> Four majors. There is something unique about this place. Especially for teachers who happen to be parents who get to watch their kids get through this place and to do so voluntarily. We call that payback. <laughs> Don't tell any administrators this, but I would gladly pay my salary to get to teach here. And I'm not the only one. It's just that we have to get the salary to raise these families. But what an amazing output of apostolic fruit I have witnessed over the years. I remember, for example, uh, CNN focusing on one of our students back in 93, following her all around in World Youth Day just to get her experience. And then in 1995, one of our alum, Steve Sanborn, starting Crossroads from the lessons that he had learned in the pro-life sacrifice while he was a, a student here, a year or two later, a dear friend and an alumni of our program in theology, the MA, Curtis Martin, establishing FOCUS, the Fellowship of Catholic University Students, here in Steubenville. Yes, brothers and sisters, this is where it started before Shaphew got it transplanted to Denver. Just parenthetically, I might add, it, it began in my basement. Uh, Curtis Martin, when I were going to be in Mother Angelica Live, in one night, and we just hadn't decided upon what we were going to talk about, and I just said, you know what, we've been discussing launching this now for almost two years. Let's just announce it tomorrow. <laughs> and he's like, you're crazy. And I said, no more than you are. <laughs> and so the next morning before we flew, I announced to all of the kids in my classes, we had just had midterms and they'd done a rather mediocre job. 
There will be extra credit for anybody who crosses the river and goes to the Ramada Inn where we're going to have a conference on Saturday called Getting Into Focus. And on the plane flight down to Alabama, Curtis and I organized our four talks. Nearly 50 kids showed up and got their extra credit, and we also found the first four Focus missionaries that year and beyond. But more than the Fellowship of Catholic University students, which really is a unique power for the new evangelization, the executive director for the Office of the New Evangelization for the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, Dr. Peter Murphy, is also an alum, a former student and a dear friend. You all probably have heard of Jason Everett, Chris Stefanik, the Augustine Institute as well. I could go on. The president of Redeemer Pacific College out in Vancouver came here to study and decided instead to go back to British Columbia and to do it there. And so Redeemer Pacific College began because of this man Tom's experience here. More recently, John Paul, the great Catholic university out in San Diego, founded by a good friend of mine named Derry. He was in the back row at noon mass and felt the inspiration that comes from this place to advance the new evangelization on the West Coast. And I could go on and on about what Nick Healy and Tom Monahan have done with Ave Maria and so on and so forth. But what I'd like to do in the closing moments is to get a little personal and share some anecdotal experience because, as I mentioned earlier, I came here in 1990. We moved in July of 1990. But it was a curious thing for me attending Mass at our parish in Joliet one last time because what we noticed was that this couple right behind us was singing loud like we did. And we were the only ones up until that Sunday at St. Pat's to sing loud. And so at the sign of peace, we turned around and we got this heartfelt, very strong handshake from a fellow we met after Mass was over named John. And John asked us what we were doing and we said nothing. Well, John, join us for lunch. And so we joined them for lunch. And no sooner had we joined John and Barbara for lunch that John blurts out, I've been an atheist for years. I'm like, oh, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> you want to know what happened? And I'm like, I do, yeah. <laughs> and he said, I bet you've never heard of the Franciscan University of Steubenville. <laughs> and I said, try me. I, I actually have. He said, well, I was just at the commencement several weeks ago, and I went there as an atheist. I didn't want to go. But what I heard at the baccalaureate and then the rest of the weekend turned my life around. It set me on fire. It brought me from death to life. And I hope you get to go there someday. <laughs> I said, John, in less than a week, we're moving there. I'm teaching there. And he was awestruck. But so was I at the privilege of going there. Another experience that I had that contributed to my own perspective on the new evangelization occurred about three years later when a, a man named Professor Rocco Butiglione came here. Uh, he was perceived, not a, well, he was not only a close friend of John Paul's, he was also recognized as having had a hand in the drafting of an encyclical, Centissimus Annus. And without acknowledging his role, he did help us a great deal in understanding this important encyclical. In the give and take that we had, it was fun to watch his interaction with the students. I remember, I think it was the last question of the, of the, of the visit, where one of our students asked him, you know, because he was so fluent in conversing with Marxists and postmodernists and radical feminists and nihilists, what can we do to be more effective at evangelizing them? And with a twinkle in his eye and a big smile, he said, make friends. He said, because as long as Marxism and feminism and postmodernism are positions to refute, you're not going to really be effective. But once you enter into the bond of friendship with Marxists and feminists and postmoderns and deconstructionists, then suddenly, out of friendship, you will allow yourself to feel the force of the arguments that have persuaded them, but you'll also be able to enter into a critical sympathy to show them where whatever truths there are will lead to the one who is the truth. Friendship is the key. I'll never forget that. Because he not only embodied it, but he also inspired a room full of our students to go out and do just that. And then about five years later, one of the most famous philosophers of the 20th century, a Jesuit professor at Fordham for years, Father Norris Clark, came and took a sabbatical and taught 
first, I think, around 97 or 98. Then he came back and taught a graduate course in the year 2000. It's hard for me to impress upon you just how much prestige that lent to Franciscan to have Norris Clark coming here to teach. Uh, Peter Kreef's mentor, uh, Frank Beckwith's mentor, he's been described as a little walking Aquinas. <laughs> very deep, very brilliant, but also very prayerful. I wasn't sure what he'd think. And so I made a point of asking him if one day after Mass I could drive him down to the Wheeling Jesuit residence where he was staying for the semester. And after Mass, I was driving down Route 7, and he looked at me and he said, this is an amazing experience. And I asked him why, and he proceeded to describe what was so amazing about teaching undergraduates here. He said, I suspect that if you looked at their standardized test scores, they might be lower than the students who I teach at Fordham. Maybe a lot lower. I don't know. But there's something about students here where they're excited. They're hungry. They're ready, willing, and able to learn. And he went on to describe what it was like for the last several weeks. And then he said, now I know why. I'm like, what do you mean? I just came from noon mass. It's the Eucharistic liturgy that is the light for their minds and the fire for their hearts. And he went on for about 10 minutes just describing what it was like to see his undergraduate students worshiping, kneeling, praying, receiving our Lord, coming back, and getting ready for the next class. This is why this place is not only where the new evangelizers are sent, but where people are being new, newly evangelized. There are many different ways to describe the charism of Franciscan University. But after nearly a quarter of a century, I would distill it down to this. This is where people's lives are changed forever. We might not be well endowed like Notre Dame and Georgetown. At times, we might seem like a ragtag university with less than 3,000 still. But I'm reminded of that old program, MASH, where some really skillful doctors on the sides of the hills of Korea probably saved more lives each day than at all of the well-stocked university hospitals back in the States. People who come here wounded go out as wounded healers to proclaim the gospel of the medicine of God's own mercy. One of my own former professors at Marquette, a Jesuit biblical scholar, came here for his sabbatical. He wanted to participate in the renewal. He wanted to evangelize. At the end of the semester, he said, I have been evangelized. My priesthood has been renewed. And as a result, he said, I look through the eyes of my students and see the scriptures in a whole new way like a child. You might only be here for two or three years. You might be here for all four and stay for the masters. However long or short it is, I want you to know that God has called you here just like he has called me. And it's not only to teach us, it's to change us. It's not only for us to get changed, but for us to get together and to get going out into the world for whom Christ suffered and died as much as he did for us. I am convinced that when history is finally over and when this particular chapter has been written, we're going to look back and understand why our children and grandkids said to us, what was it like to be at Franciscan University of Steubenville? In the days of John Paul, in the days of Benedict, in the days of Francis, in the days when the new evangelization really spread like wildfire. And we'll have stories to tell. We'll have graces to relate. But we'll also see the lives of the loved ones of God, his beloved sons and daughters, who have been in our households, in our classes, in our rosary walks, in our pro-life marches, who are going to shine like the stars in heaven forever and ever. That's who we are. That's why we're here. And as long as we remember how God's strength is made perfect in our weakness, we're going to be the instruments by which the new evangelization succeeds beyond our prayers and beyond our wildest dreams. If God did it before with a pre-Christian, imperial, Roman, pagan culture of death, there's no reason to think he can't do it again. I am convinced that he can and wants to more than we want him to, and that he is capable of doing more than we are capable of asking him thus far because of how little our faith is. So let's join our hearts together now in prayer and ask him to increase our faith. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we are so unspeakably proud of you. For what you have accomplished in creating this world and in sending your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to redeem it. Not just to forgive us of our sins, but to heal us. And not just to heal us from the effects of our sins, but to make us holy. To transform us through your love to make us saints and nothing less. We thank you, Lord, for the communion that unites us to all believers through baptism and the Holy Eucharist around this globe and stretching all the way from earth to heaven. We thank you, Abba Father, not only for the gift of Jesus Christ, but for the power of the Holy Spirit, the principal agent of the new evangelization. In order for this new evangelization to bear fruit, that is enduring, we need a new Pentecost. We need to experience the graces and the gifts of the Holy Spirit in a new way every day. Father, this is what Jesus Christ has merited through his passion, death, and resurrection. So here are prayers that originate not simply in our hearts, but in his most sacred heart, especially as we unite our voices and pray that family prayer that he himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mary, star of the new evangelization, pray for us in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.